Welcome back Watershed Peeps. This is Dr. Toby Dogweiler and I'm here today to go over very quickly how to calculate discharge. We're going to keep this super short so let's get rolling. Okay first a little overview of discharge. Discharge is a measurement of the amount of water or the volume of water moving past a specific point on a stream per unit time. To calculate discharge we need two things. Q is discharge and the equation is just velocity times area. Velocity is something we measure directly in the stream with a velocity meter. It's represented by the red arrow here. And area, if we have an idealized channel like this one, which has a rectangular cross section, is just width times depth. Now in a real channel, we'll get to that in a second, width and depth are not uniform, so you can't just simply measure how wide the channel is and how deep, because where would you measure? It's different depths in different places, and it can be different widths at the top or the bottom. All right, now, a, a quick comment on units for discharge. Uh, in the simplistic fashion, discharge is reported in cubic length per time, which essentially means volume per time. So cubic length or a volume would be something like a cubic meter, a cubic foot, a liter, a gallon. Time could be a second, a minute, an hour. Now internationally and in scientific writing, we would usually report discharge in either cubic meters per second or liters per unit time. Uh, the liters per unit time is used for very small discharges, and it could be minutes or hours, depending on how small the discharge is. In the U.S., you'll see uh, discharge is usually reported in CFS, which is cubic feet per second. All right, let's take a look at an actual stream cross-section. So you may recall the video that I posted that my students at Winona State University made a number of years ago about how to measure discharge using the float or weighting method. The float method that they demonstrated was in Burns Valley Creek. Um, this is a cross-section of Burns Valley Creek. You can see it's a real creek, so it's got um, uh, variation in depth across it and the width varies a little bit from the top is the widest part and it narrows towards the bottom. All right, so how do we tackle this? Because we can't just take a width and a depth and average them together. So the way we do that is we divide the stream up into subsections. Um, normally you would divide your stream into at least 10 subsections. So here we have a four meter wide stream. It goes from zero on the left to four on the right. So maybe we divide the stream into 40 centimeter boxes. However, just to keep this demonstration simple and quick, I'm only going to divide into four boxes. Thus, each of our boxes is one meter wide, zero to one, one to two, and so forth. So let's enter our widths. Our widths are always going to be one one meter. There we go. All right, now our depths do vary. So our first depth here on the left is 0 0.16, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.24. All right, now the spreadsheet is automatically calculating these areas for me. The area for this first rectangle um, is 0.16. For the second is 0.15. If we total all of those up, we get a total cross-sectional area for the whole stream of 0.75. Now note, by making a bunch of small boxes, um, even though the cross-section is irregular, the small boxes, the small rectangles start to approximate the, uh, the actual area for that part of the stream. And this, this third box right here is a good example. This area of the box is actually outside of the stream boundary. So this is sort of an overmeasurement. Now this small area down here is actually not inside our rectangle, so it's an undermeasurement. But this approximately equals this, meaning that that rectangle is a pretty accurate representation of the area of this, this subsection of the stream. Now, some rectangles will be better at um, estimating than others. You can see out here at the edges, we've got big areas that are going to be counted, this whole area out here that really aren't in the stream. That's why it's important to do 10 or more of these in a real measurement so that these errors become as small as possible and have more chance to cancel each other out. Okay, so now we've got the total area which is 0.75. Now the next thing we would do is come through and measure our discharges, our, our velocities. Now velocity is usually measured at about one half stream depth. Actually it's six tenths of stream depth, but for our purposes six tenths is one half. Um, so the, the green dot here would represent where the flow, the flow meter 
sensor actually is that's doing the measurement. For this first box on the left, our flow velocity measurement was 0.11 meters per second. Um, the next one is 0 0.08, 0 0.13, and 0 0.06. All right, so now velocity times area, 0.11 times 0.16 gives us a discharge for this rectangle of 0 0.018. Um, and you can see the discharges for each of the four rectangles. If we total, sum up all four of those subsection discharges, we get a total discharge of 0 0.07 cubic meters per second. Um, and that's our, that's our discharge for this stream. So this is how you calculate discharge using the weighting method. Um, where you've got a velocity meter and you divide the stream into sections. Um, I'm not going to re-explain how to do the, the float method because I think the students in the video did a fine job of that. It's a little simpler. It's more of an approximation and not as precise as this method, the weighting method. But that float method can be a very quick and accurate enough estimation for many purposes. So keep it in mind. It's actually accepted by the EPA as admissible data. Um, of course, the weighting method is too, but it's more time and, and equipment intensive. Okay, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.